think everybody can see my slides now, um, or I hope so. Um, right, and just a couple of disclosures here uh, for the um, for the presentation. So, you know, I think uh, Dr. Mateen set this up, you know, perfectly um, as a setup to talk about what's next. You know, and, and when I see patients in clinic, this is absolutely, you know, what I do. And, and we do this for all the cancers that we treat. But I think, you know, as we noted, this grade is extremely important uh, to help us risk stratify. So we say, let's talk about risk for patients with UTUC. So we're all, a, a big part of that comes in in these gradings, right? So we talk about low risk patients. These are the patients that as we go along here, I'm gonna talk about trying to, to save kidneys and, and not have to do radical surgery on, you know, if, if these are patients with bladders, we're talking about bladder cancers where we're just removing the tumors um, and, and doing things like that. Um, but this low risk are patients with small tumors throughout the, the ureter uh, or renal pelvis um, anything above the bladder, as we talked earlier, a smaller size, um, single tumors. We do a biopsy, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, some of the implications and, and the difficulties um, of doing those biopsies. And when we look at these patients and we look at CAT scans, we don't see any evidence of invasiveness on a, a CT scan for staging. Again, a reminder here is that, you know, we, we always say how important biopsies, biopsies are and, um, you know, a tissue is so important for us to pa pass on to our pathology colleagues uh, for them to grade these tumors for aggressiveness um, and potentially grade these tumors for invasiveness as well. So, what about these patients that don't fit the criteria? Or what about these tumors, I should say, that don't fit the criteria for those low risk disease? We're talking about patients with high risk disease. So these are patients who already, you know, they may have swelling of the inside lining of their kidney. We call that hydronephrosis, meaning there's a tumor in that funnel that's blocking off the drainage of the kidney in some, in some way. So urine is not funneling its way out as it would normally. Um, a larger tumor size in the kidney that we may see um, when we do biopsy and the pathologist tells us it's high grade. So very aggressive or more aggressive looking tumors as far as you know, uh, looking at the cells, the tumor cells under the microscope. Multifocal, meaning this is a tumor that's not located in just one spot in the ureter or just not one spot in the upper, uh, you know, up in the kidney, but maybe in multiple locations up and along that ureter. Um, or patients who have had other um, variants of bladder cancer or have had um, aggressive interventions or invasive bladder cancer are also patients that we think of as higher risk for um, upper tract disease. So, you know, uh, Dr. Mateen mentioned this uh, a little bit, and, and this is something in the daily life of a urologist that, that we think about and we talk about with our patients because getting a diagnosis, a true pathologic diagnosis that's reliable for grading and risk assessment for a patient can be quite difficult. Right. And I say this in contrast to bladder cancer, right, which is urethelial cell carcinoma of the lower urinary tract or of the bladder of that urethelium. And we do things called, a, you know, we call it a TURBT or a transurethral resection of a bladder tumor. And, you know, on these pictures, you know, here that you can see is it's, you know, when we see a tumor in the bladder, we have this little hot instrument through a cystoscope when we're looking inside that we're able to scrape that tumor out as well as some of the muscle wall and some of the bladder wall at the same time. That allows us to have a larger piece of tissue for the pathologist to give us a reliable diagnosis. Upper tract or 
working in this ureter tube, we often use what we call a ureteroscopy, right? This is very similar to what urologists use or exactly what urologists use for patients who have kidney stones or obstructing, you know, ureteral stones. And so it's a very common procedure for urologists where we're taking this scope similar to a cystoscope, but very small. Um, you know, I tell people, you know, as, as big as the, the end of my ink pen, um, you know, when it when it's open um, and we're going and we're putting that camera all the way up these ureter tubes up into the kidney. Now, what does that allow us to do? It allows us to directly see that. Dr. Mateen had some pictures as well um, of what these tumors might look like. You know, here's a picture here of a tumor blocking off a, a ureter tube. And then we have to figure out a way to get a biopsy and get it pulled back down that little tiny tube and enough of a biopsy for us to reliably look at under the microscope and say, this is low, this is low grade, this is high grade, and is it an invasive tumor or not? And so the dip, the, it can be quite difficult, you know, over here on my far right hand side picture, you know, I put, we use these little baskets oftentimes to do a biopsy um, of trying to grab a piece of this tumor off so that we can look at it under the microscope or so our pathologist can look at it under the microscope for us. Um, you know, we, we get a diagnosis and I think, you know, one thing that we, we talk about and, and Dr. Mateen mentioned this as well is, is staging is important, more so for our patients, obviously, who are high risk with high grade disease. Um, oftentimes patients come and they've already had some sort of CAT scan or an MRI or there's a way that we found this cancer um, in the first place. Um, but other imaging can be important, you know, for staging, looking at the chest, um, along with that CT of the abdomen. And then obviously we're also looking at kidney function and other things um, that play into what our treatment options may be down the road. So, you know, I, I say this as treatment should be based on risk. And this is true for anything that we do. Low risk disease or low grade disease should not equal aggressive interventions. Instead, we should save what we call nephrons. Those are, that's what makes up a kidney. We're wanting to spare kidneys. High risk disease equals aggressive interventions. Um, we need to be doing operations or therapies um, with curative intent for these individuals. Well, but there is some question of maybe there are options for patients that we can still spare nephrons in patients with more, uh, with higher risk of disease. So uh, without going in too much detail of, of high and low and, and all of these different gradings are, you know, in a nutshell, what are our treatment options? So a little bit of this, so I, I flip to the very bottom of the slide first and say I'm going to um, rely on Dr. Campbell to answer some of our uh, still unanswered questions about chemotherapies uh, for upper tract disease um, before and after surgery and now in the era of immunotherapies. So some of our treatment options are things aggressively such as a nephrourethorectomy with a lymph node dissection. A nephrourethorectomy is in contrast to a nephrectomy, which would be nephro means kidney, so removal of the kidney. What's important when we're talking about upper tract disease is that we remove that entire system. So here's a pathology gross picture of a patient's kidney, their ureter, their funnel draining all the way down here into the bladder, and there's even a small cuff of bladder that's removed at the same time. Um, there are you know, options for patients to do what we would call a ureterectomy if a tumor is located or isolated to a solitary place within the ureter. Um, and then we talk about endoscopic ablations. Um, and that is very similar to what, again, we do this via a ureteroscope that um, uh, we would use for, that a urologist would use for stones oftentimes. And on my right hand side here, I have a picture of um, the inside of a kidney. This is in the calyx in one of those, those fingers of, of the kidney. And there's a tumor here on the bottom and you can see this blue 
with a red light on the end of it being a laser fiber and we're ablating or lasering off this tumor. Um, and then of course, discussions of chemotherapies that are put intracavitary or directly into the kidney, um, uh, similar to what we've historically thought about putting BCG or chemotherapy into the bladder. And then of course, I couldn't not put on there um, option of a clinical trial for patient for, for treatment options. Um, I'm going to just show a couple more pictures for each of these uh, different treatments that we would be doing in, for patients that come to see us uh, for these disease processes. So a nephro-ureterectomy um, is, you know, I, I have the same picture of showing that it's the kidney, the entire ureter tube that comes out. Um, it can be done in many different ways. It can be done in an open approach through an incision in the abdomen, done robotically. It can be done laparoscopically, um, just as long as that kidney, that ureter, that, that little piece of bladder is removed all at once. Um, and then a lymph node dissection uh, as well. Um, and so here's some pictures of, of what that would look like robotically. And then really uh, what's, what you're seeing here is this, this circle on the bottom is our bladder. And so we're seeing our ureter tube that's coming in and we're taking just enough of a piece of bladder to get that entire, entire ureter out and not leaving anything behind. And then we sew up that small hole in the bladder that we've made. Uh, for a nephro-ureterectomy. Um, and so next, I'm just going to focus a little bit more on, you know, saving our kidneys and the uh, ablations, the biopsies, uh, the chemotherapeutics that we may use as urologists in uh, today's world of 2022. Um, and why do we want to save kidneys? Why? Because Dr. Mateen showed us in the, one of his very first slides that recurrence rates happen. We've talked about the risk factors of, of smoking and other risks um, for upper tract disease and disease can come back metachronously. That means in, 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 um, at a later time, right? That can happen in, in the same kidney. It can happen in another kidney. It can happen within the bladder taking out kidneys can impact a patient's overall life, right? So that is uh, impactful in potential future therapies. Um, it can be impactful for, uh, you know, removing kidneys also have a great part in uh, blood pressure control and our diabetes. And so we're really trying to help with that. Uh, I say, when do you save kidneys? Always is a good answer, if possible, right? That always comes with a, a tongue in cheek uh, quote unquote, if possible. And how do we do that? We do that often with these ablations as I showed you in the first picture. And then now uh, since 2020, talking about some chemo ablations uh, at the same time. So uh, I, I showed you those pictures, ablations with or without um, chemotherapy uh, that can be done. In, in today's world, we talked about this intraluminal chemotherapies and how the bladder is a storage um, location, right? And so it uh, makes sense that you can put a chemotherapy in there and it stays. Um, the kidney on, on the other hand, it doesn't stay. Everything drains right back out um, of the kidney, but there is um, newly in 2022 an approval for um, what's called gel mito uh, it uses a reverse hydrogel technology uh, for installation of a mitomycin C chemotherapy within the black or within the upper urinary tract within the renal pelvis. Um, and it's very, very well known to urologists. It's six weeks of a weekly, you know, installation is what it's have to be FDA approved. Um, and uh, the dosage is dependent on uh, what we find at the time of, uh, of a patient's ureteroscopy when we're looking and doing that biopsy. And the reminder that I have here is this is for patients with low risk disease. Um, and so I just, my, 
um, one of my final slides is, is, is I really like, you know, and I, I really like to save kidneys if possible. And some of these things can be done in multiple settings and clinic settings and operating room settings. Um, it's familiar to us as urologists. Um, it's quite tolerable for the patients. Um, and it can avoid uh, repetitive uh, surgeries, repetitive um, anesthetics for our patients if possible. My last take home point from a urology aspect is uh, based on one of those first slides that recurrences happen. Recurrences happen and they can occur in the same kidney if it's still there, it can happen in the other kidney and it can happen in the bladder. And I think that's something really important for us is that we definitely need that ongoing management. Um, you know, Dr. Mateen said up to 40% of patients could have, you know, a bladder cancer up after a urethelial of the upper urinary tract. And so we do need ongoing management of the bladder. We need it of the upper urinary tract. We need it of the lymph nodes, um, of everything else. And of course, we're monitoring a patient's kidney function at the same time. Um, so uh, any comments um, from Dr. Campbell, because he sees these patients, you know, after, often after they're seeing us as urologists or Dr. Mateen of anything he, different that he does in his practice or any good points. You know, I'm just very lucky to have a chance to work with, with um, Dr. Mateen with a lot of these patients because it, I think best care really is a team effort for a lot of patients and trying to figure out best strategies to help maintain kidney function as much as possible and to, to give patients you know, every chance to treat cancer while it's still localized uh, and before it has spread. And so um, again, I really lean on Dr. Mateen's expertise in, in helping um, understand when, when treatments are best given locally versus when I can lend a helping hand with uh, treatment to make uh, surgery either more feasible or more reasonable for patients. Thanks, Matt, for those comments. You know, the only thing I guess that I would add is, and it's something that I think we, you know, even in our very detailed conversations at our conferences, we sometimes don't really uh, to talk about at all, which is how much disease is there. You know, kidney preservation is so easy when there's very little disease. Um, on the other hand, when there's a high volume disease and there's a lot of it, even if you think it's all low grade, um, it's a real challenge. And so, um, you know, I've, I, as someone who is, who is and, uh, you know, still eager to preserve kidneys when you can, I think there's still indications for surgery remove the kidney and the ureter, you know, if it's low grade, um, because it's just so much to put the patient through sometimes to, you know, get all the disease and preserve the kidney when there's a lot of it there. And quite honestly, I'm not sure it's, it's really worth it, you know, and uh, hopefully they have a normal con opposite kidney um, and, with, you know, that's going to function well. And of course, in those cases, you know, we have a conversation about that. Uh, but I do think it's something that we need to start highlighting a little bit, um, you know, when we go to conferences and have these conversations and maybe even in the guidelines, you know, trying to be a little bit precise about how much disease is actually there because there's just, it's just that practical factor of, you know, there's only so much we can do um, with our kidney preserving techniques. Yeah, 